Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Hello and welcome to the GSMC College Football Podcast, hosted by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Ethan Orfe, and we're going to have a real interesting conversation today. We're going to be going over some Oklahoma LSU news. We're going to be going over people skipping bowl games to prepare for the draft, a little bit about Jim Harbaugh and how Michigan fans should really be judging their coaches, Uh, some Tua draft projections, and a little bit of fun about who will be your top three people to start a school around in college football. Here we go. So, let's do some Oklahoma LSU conversation. We're going to go ahead and talk about their, their a bit under man Oklahoma is right now. Oklahoma players have been suspended from the semifinals against LSU in the playoffs, that would be Ronnie Perkins, Ramondre Stevenson, and Trajan Bridges. Now, Ronnie Perkins, sophomore, having a decent season right now, has a uh, six sacks, a few pressures, a good amount of tackles coming out at the defensive end position. Ramondre Stevenson uh, seemingly making himself known in the offense after becoming basically the second back in that offense and picking up some good yardage has about 900 so yards on the season. That's going to be a big hit for them to be able to run the offense. And Trajan Bridges, who honestly hasn't been that great this season, but uh, he is also suspended. So what does that really mean? For the Sooners, going into this playoff push, and really that's just another, another downside of going up against someone like LSU. When you don't have depth at certain positions and you lose people due to injury or due to misconduct, it hurts, especially when you are trying to make it to the pinnacle, the top of the mountain. And making it to the top of the mountain is not easy in any level of a sport. So I know a lot of Oklahoma fans are going to be looking forward to this game no matter what happens and, you know, next man up. But these are significant pieces to miss in the offense. Maybe not Trajan Bridges so much because he hasn't really produced that much in a few games. However, Ronnie Perkins, it's hard to replace somebody who has been a consistent starter on your defense. That's just not very easy to do. And Ramondre Stevenson, he's someone who can really get you some, rack up some yardage, get you in the end zone. And that's just, you can't really buy talent in this, in this industry and in the collegiate football space. So that's somebody they're definitely going to be missing. However, they do have somebody in the backfield that can really get it going, which is Kenny Brooks, who has been having a nice season thus far. And he's going to have to pick up some of the load on that end of the rushing game. So we really have to look at what they are working with now. Now they just have, uh, Jalen Hurts trying to lead an offense that honestly could probably move the ball a bit against LSU's defense. LSU's defense has been challenged as they have gone through the SEC gauntlet, and a lot of people proclaim that the SEC is not as dominant as it once was maybe four or five years ago, and there's a lot of stats to back that up. However, defense may not be what the SEC is all about anymore. They still are a very, very, very tough conference to play in. And to be honest, it's still probably the top one or two conference in college football to play in. So LSU, of course, still undefeated, has not taken a loss. And they did, you only can play with who's on your schedule. 
and they did what they needed to do to get to where they are. Although their defense, however, has looked a bit shaky in certain games, and some people have said, oh, well, you know, like against Texas, LSU gave up a few good points to Texas early on in the season. They said, oh, well, that game was kind of lost in the third quarter, and it was just garbage time points. A lot of people proclaim that LSU deals with a lot of garbage time points, so they give up the scores and it makes their numbers look bad. Well, at the end of the day, points are points, and you want your players to keep playing hard, and they give up a lot of points on defense, and sometimes that can really bite you coming back when teams are able to scheme on you and look. Oklahoma's had a few weeks now to really look at the LSU defense and what they do best and what they what they struggle in. So it would not be wise for people to think that uh, LSU is just going to dominate Oklahoma, at least on the defensive end. Now, offensively, we're not really sure what Oklahoma can do to stop the LSU offense. The LSU offense is dynamic, probably the, arguably the best offense in college football. Yeah, Ohio State might have the edge over that, but it's kind of giving, it's like apples and, it's like comparing apples to apples, but one is your favorite. So, you know, you have Granny Smith and you have Honeycrisp. Which one do you want? They're both really top-tier offenses, so it's up to a lot of that defense to make some stops. And if you can make a stop in this game, I feel like you have a good chance of winning. And LSU seems to be more primed to make some stops than Oklahoma, especially because there is a big key injury in the Oklahoma secondary, which is Delarian Turner-Yell. He has a broken collarbone. It will not be playing in the semifinals against LSU. And what does that tell me as someone who watches college football is that these LSU wide receivers are going to get active down the field. They are not looking to... The LSU offense is looking to attack, 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 right? So when you have injuries and you have people replacing them, they know that that's an area of the football of the football field to really attack and look and see if that person is ready for this sort of limelight, this sort of assignment. If they can't handle it, they are going to attack them and abuse that matchup because that's just what you do in sports. You abuse matchups that seem favorable to you. And at the end of the day, Ed Orgeron and their offensive coordinators are going to be looking at this Oklahoma defense, seeing that two key starters are out, one injury, one is suspension. They're going to try and attack that matchup as much as possible to get an advantage. So when you look at Oklahoma, what can they really do? Jalen Hurts is just one man. LSU has been a dominant scoring machine. And I don't know if Jalen Hurts is going to be able to keep up, especially if their defense can't get a few stops in this game. So I would say that there should be a lot of pressure on Jalen Hurts, but I don't really think he's going to play with a lot of pressure, only because at the end of the day, we know that Oklahoma is the underdog. And it seems like Jalen Hurts likes the idea of being the underdog. He still maintains that Alabama mentality. Uh, he's had multiple quotes throughout the year where he still sounds like he plays for Nick Saban, but he's just uh, wired differently. So he's not going to look at this and go into this game and think, oh man, LSU is going to be so tough to beat. He's going to go out there and really try and play hard and get this win because he feels like the people around him are capable of getting this W for him. And he's going to play his best football that he can play on that day. And he has a top three head coach in college football in Lincoln Riley. And he believes in his head coach and his head coach believes in him. And at the end of the day, that can be a really powerful thing. And we've seen upsets before where people uh, just assume that so like Alabama versus Auburn a few years ago during the kick six, people didn't expect Auburn to really be in that game as 
much as they were. Alabama was a really, really, really good team back then. And as you know, Auburn has a little bit of a trick play mindset, run the football. They can be traditional, but their offensive, uh, their offensive play calling is designed to really get people thinking more and it can get really creative. But they, no one ever really thought that, oh man, Auburn is really, really close to beating Alabama and they can actually go in and win that game. But that Iron Bowl game really proved something to a lot of people that you can take down some of these giants, even if you're undermanned or you seem as a lower tier team than them. We're going to go into a quick break here, and coming after that break, we're going to talk about Ohio State, Clemson, what Clemson has to do to complete this upset, and why people are not really thinking that it's as possible as they should. Coming right up. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC College Football Podcast, where before... We went to break. We talked about Oklahoma, LSU, players missing, some injuries, and why it's going to be a tough a tough scenario for Oklahoma, but they are not going to think it's so tough. Now we're going to get into the, I guess, the breadwinner matchup of the semis, which is Clemson versus Ohio State. Now, if you were to look at somebody who hasn't watched college football all year long, right, and they only watch Clemson barely go tooth and nail with North Carolina, you're probably thinking that Clemson being in the top four is a bit misleading, and they may not be as good, and probably a surprise. However, Clemson has been on a roll, and you can only play who are on your schedule and who is in front of you week to week. However, Clemson has been dominant ever since that game. Their offense has been clicking on all cylinders. People have slept on Clemson. And they're going to be that team that once they go down, and if they do beat Ohio State, and decisively, decisively, if they beat Ohio State, then everybody's going to start turning, turning their heads and looking back at the season history from this year. And really thinking about how we've let Clemson kind of teeter into the college football playoffs and we just dismissed them because of the competition. The ACC hasn't been as good. They just blow out teams that aren't as good. But they've beat some pretty decent teams. Virginia is a really good team. And they demolished Virginia in the championship game. Demolished them. It was a barn burner one side bar burner. Half the barn is burnt. <laughs> and Clemson handles their business. That's what they're known to do. They had questionable things from their offense. Their quarterback was a bit shaky in the beginning. His touchdown to interception ratio was a bit weird. And his decision making was uh, not what we've seen from him in the past. Especially in the college football playoffs from last year. So people were a bit worried, but they look like they're back to what they were last year when they went and won the whole national championship. So what does that mean going up against Ohio State, who they did beat 
a year ago and very decisively in a, a 31-0 victory. Well, we have to look at Ohio State, who has, they have played a lot of good teams in their division, however, in their conference, and they have just been as equally as dominant in their own conference, and so has LSU, so has Oklahoma. All these teams in have been the conference dominant. So they're the alphas of the college football playoffs. That's why they're all top four. Now, Ohio State is different because there's just so many new pieces. A new head coach, a new transfer quarterback from Georgia, a lot of good defensive players, and we're going to just see a star-studded affair. It's going to look like the NFL Combine as far as this is what we're going to see in the Combine. All these players from all these teams, they're all NFL prospects, and we're going to be seeing them play Sunday football for years to come. But this is the game in front of them. And who is going to prepare? I really think this is going to be such, such, such a big game when it comes to the coaching aspect. Who is going to be able to make a game plan strong enough to where not only their offense can score consistently and get down the field, because both these teams have really, really good defenses, and we're going to really see who has the edge. And it's going to have to be through coaching and who has the most experience. And which is why I'm thinking that Clemson may be able to make a run at this thing. When you've been to the mountain before, when you face teams like an Alabama a few times, and you've gone into slugfest in these college football players, that really builds experience. You can't take anybody lightly when they have beaten Nick Saban, in my opinion. Nick Saban is... Arguably one of the best coaches of all time. Might be the best coach of all time in the college football era, in the BCS, and now in the college football playoff era for sure. And when we look at people who have been able to outplay Nick Saban, outcoach him in certain scenarios, it's because they get into, they know what it takes. You can get into a scoring match with certain people. But it's all about getting that key defensive stops. Because at this point, I don't think we're at the point in the college football playoff scenario where all these teams' offenses are so good that the defense is going to give up points. I don't expect shutouts in any of these games. They're going to give up some points. LSU's defense is probably the third best in from all these teams. So they're going to give up some points. Ohio State has a really good defense. Clemson's offense, Clemson's offense is incredible. They're going to give up some points. Ohio State offense is incredible. Clemson's going to give up some points. But it doesn't mean they are going to get into a 70-75 game. They're going to get some stops. They have playmakers. In these sort of games, it's not about what if you can get a three and out here or there. It's more about when that team is driving down the field and they're on your own 35. Can you get that key sack to hold them to a field goal instead of seven? Can you get that key interception or key deflection when they're on your own 45 and driving in the second quarter to get your team the ball back to give them more opportunity to score? It's all about making key plays in these sort of big game, big situation environments. And I guarantee you they're practicing that sort of stuff all week long. Game situations, game scenarios, what to look for, matchups to exploit. It's all about getting your players to prepare to make the biggest play of their life. And that's on both sides of the ball. But it's especially on the defense because... You can give up five yards a carry for a whole for a whole drive, and they're really marching down the field. But all it takes is one, one, one good play. Just one. You see it all the time. All it takes is one key pass deflection 
and pop it up in the air and give yourself a chance to make a play on the ball. Because it's not about the bend, don't break scenarios. Nobody bends and breaks in the NFL, college football, anymore. That's not a, that's not a good strategy anymore. Offensive score so well. Schemes are so much better. The rules make it easier for offenses to really, to really try and destroy you on defense. So the whole idea of Ben don't break, just give them field goals is not really good because in practice, you're still going to give up seven more times than not. You're not going to be the person that only gives up nine points on three offensive drives. And you're typically not going to get a lot of defensive stands against some of these bigger offenses and some of these offensive-minded geniuses that have come around in the last four or five years. They are designed to break you, and they know your weaknesses, and they know how to exploit them. So what do you need to do? You have to know that you are talented enough and you have the players that are willing to go out there and play hard and play fast and play physical and make a difference. You want difference makers on the field. And I think Clemson has a lot of those difference makers. And what's different about Clemson, comparative to Ohio State, is that they've been there before. They've been there before for three years. Experience matters. In all assets of every game, everything you do, experience matters. So, with all that being said, we're going to take a quick break. And when I come back, we are going to look at the future of Michigan football, and that goes with their head coach. We're going to see just exactly is the problem with Jim Harbaugh, if he has a problem. Come right up. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back. Last time, we were talking about some Clemson versus Ohio State. And now we're going to get a little bit into this Jim Harbaugh Michigan situation. Now, Jim Harbaugh is a good coach. And that's where my stance is. I believe Jim Harbaugh is a good coach, maybe even an excellent coach. And I believe he set himself up a bit early on when he got the Michigan job for what is coming to him now, which is a lot of murmurs of Jim Harbaugh not returning to Michigan or being let go. And all because he has not been able to beat Ohio State. So let me preface my statements by saying, when you are brought in from the NFL and you are seen as a good coach, a good defensive-minded coach, somebody who can get the job done, the only thing Michigan fans, supporters, they only care about beating Ohio State. And if you can't do that, then it's all for naught. Seriously. It's the same thing with LSU. LSU doesn't care about going to the national championship to a certain degree only because they know every year their only shot of going is to beat Alabama. If you don't beat Alabama, it's a lost season. There's no point. You're not getting it's not getting done after that. It's the same thing with Michigan and Michigan State, all those teams. If you don't beat Ohio State, 
the season is done. You can be, everybody knows, you can be 8-0, 10-0, 7-0, whenever that game comes, Ohio State versus Michigan, you know in your heart of hearts that that is your championship game. No matter what you do, it's your championship game. And he has not beaten Ohio State a single time since he's been there. Now you can argue that, well, Ohio State has more talent. It has uh, better coaching, better scenarios. Recruitment is better. All that could be true, but that doesn't matter to the Ohio, excuse me, to the Michigan fan. It doesn't matter to the the donors and the Michigan supporters that are giving money to the school in order for the product to be better. And that's not what they brought in Jim Harbaugh to do. I say all this to say that there is a concept that I think a lot of fans don't put into perspective. And that is, is he actually getting the job done or is he not? Jim Harbaugh, since coming there, has had a very, very positive record in the win-loss column. The team has been competitive. And there hasn't been really a big blemish on his record besides the fact that he can't beat Ohio State. Well, let me ask you, who really has beaten Ohio State in the last few years of this run since he's been there. Not a lot of teams. Ohio State's really good. And they've been really good for a long time. When Urban got there, they were really good. When Urban left, they're still really good. It's hard. Winning is hard, especially against good teams. Now, you could argue that he was out coached. He's been out coaching games. He has shot himself in the foot in some games against Ohio State. But yeah, that's Ohio State. You know what else? shot themselves in the foot in Ohio State. All those teams last year, the year before that, who had chances to beat them to go into the playoffs, and they couldn't get that done either. I just believe that the criticism is a bit unfair, only because for wanting him gone. If you want to criticize him for not being able to get to the apex that he predicted himself that he could bring this college to, then sure, that's a fair criticism. He set himself up for that. However, if you think he's a bad coach or he's not the coach for Michigan or that he should be fired or let go for somebody else, then I'll argue who else is really left? Who who do you want to run your program that would do just as good or better? Well, better, I should say. Let's say better because that's what you want. You want him to be Ohio State. Who is better for that Michigan job than him right now? Because I can't really name anybody who's better. There's nobody that I can think of that's going to leave a position that they're already in that would be better at coaching than Jim Harbaugh, especially coaching that Michigan team. Now, you can talk about how the recruits aren't going to Michigan as much or not in the top 10 in recruiting or they're not doing this, that, or the third to make themselves more competitive than Ohio State, but it's really tough. You got to know that area on how to recruit players in the in the local regions. It's the same reason why people don't get coaches outside of the SEC in the SEC very often because when you transfer from, let's say you go to the Big Ten, you're from the Big Ten and you go to the SEC, when that coach is going on recruiting, it's very tough for them because you got to know kids in the South. You got to know how those people operate, what they like, what they don't like, to bring them in and recruit them. It's very difficult, especially if your name isn't as big and you're trying to up, trying to build a program from the ground up. Now, Michigan is a very infamous program. There's a lot of names, a lot of history there. However, it's the same thing when you're in that locale, location, of the unit the US you have to know what where, where your recruits are who they are what they like what they don't like and how to bring them in Urban Meyer was really good at recruiting he could recruit in the SEC and clearly he can recruit where he was at Ohio State now i don't think Jim Harbaugh has done a bad job recruiting he's had talent there's people that have gone over to the NFL from Michigan since he's been there 
but he's not getting as much talent. And that just honestly could be a product of that. Ohio State is a very, 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 very popular choice that five-star, four-star recruits want to go to. Alabama sucks in five-star recruits like it's no business. Offensive linemen, they know where to go. If you want to go to the league and you want to be an offensive lineman, Wisconsin's where it's at. Alabama is where it's at. LSU is where it's at. You got to know where you where you belong. And I think that's where a lot of people are starting to understand. You got to know where you belong. And Jim is working with what he has. And I think he hasn't done a horrible job. I think he's done a pretty good job. Michigan's competitive. Michigan's a fun team to watch. But in this day and age, if you're not winning the big the big game, the big dance, you get let go. Les Miles was not able to beat LSU. I'm sorry. Les Miles was not able to bring LSU to beat Alabama for a number of years. And I think people were tired of it. And as soon as LSU really hit rock bottom, which rock bottom for LSU is seven and four in this era, that's just not good enough. And when you can't beat Alabama and you start losing games, that's when things start to shake. When Jim Harbaugh starts losing games, not just to Ohio State, but to other top 25 teams, sub-25 teams, that's when you start questioning, oh man, is this man's job security in question? Can he get the job done? Is he a right coach for us? Not because he can't beat a really, really gifted team that's been good for five plus years and has one of the top three coaches in the league. No, that's not when. Now, you can. it's fair to criticize, but I don't know if that means it's time to go to the chopping block. It's time to send this guy packing. Because what you're doing then is you're building this expectation for whoever is next that this is what you need to do. And I don't think that's possible for anybody right now. Ohio State might win the national championship. It's very possible that they can do that. Michigan was never in a position to where this is their year to win. We never thought that they were going to be this good to win the national championship. Now, placing this idea that they can beat somebody who is essentially contending for the national championship has a resume that makes it seem like they are the best team in the country What more do you want from Jim Harbaugh? All right. So that's that on that topic. We're going to take a quick break. And coming up, we're going to talk about players who are not going to be playing in some bowl games and the whole whole idea of sitting out bowl games to prepare for the draft. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC College Football Podcast, where last time we were talking about some Jim Harbaugh. Some Michigan, some Ohio State, and now we're going to get into one of the more bigger topics surrounding college football and recruitment and NFL draft all all in one, and that is, do bowl games actually matter anymore? Now, that's more of a segue from what I teased in the last segment where we were talking about some college football players are electing to skip their bowl games to prepare for the NFL draft. Some of them are first-round talents, some of them are not. And just my general thoughts on this whole this whole ordeal. And to be honest, I'm a bit 
everything is nuanced. I don't think every decision is a good decision, and I don't think every time a player decides that they are going to skip their bowl game is a bad thing. I believe if you know you're talented enough, you've seen the reports, you've read articles, you know which players are going to be going to the NFL draft, who are going to be drafted prospects, the first rounders, the second rounders, third rounders. You know those guys. Now, I would argue that there are some players who are looking at their draft stock, who what they can do, what they can't do, and they feel like they have to do something extra to prove themselves worthy of going to the NFL. As you know, getting into the NFL is one of the hardest things to do in any sport, and you do need to prepare. But the counter is, why wouldn't you finish out that last game and make a statement for yourself in one of those games? It's just like people who perform well in the senior board. In the senior, it's just like when people go out to the senior bowl and perform really well and they build their draft stock off a single game because that's what everybody's watching. Now, this Saturday, there are some bowl games played, of course, but that NFL had some games playing at the same time. So it's very possible that the ratings were not the best for those bowl games and thus why some of those bowl games were not really promoted as much so as you would like to see from the college football associates. But they still played, and I think that that's a good thing. People should like to play in bowl games because you only get one bowl game every so often unless your team is good. If your team is good, you'll get a bowl game. And I think what is happening since people play three years in college football, they'll have played two bowl games, and they know what that feels like if they win them. And so so on and so forth. And it's not the same feeling as winning a national title. Of course, if you are in contention for the national title, most people end up playing in those games. I don't think I've seen a situation where somebody decides to declare to the draft after a national title. That's just not really something that happens. However, I couldn't put it past somebody if they really think they're that talented. But it's just unheard of. It's not the spirit of football. You want to go and win, win it all. And if you have the chance to do that, you should. So why is going to bowl games different? It's because there's not, the risk reward is so, so low for a lot of players. You're in, you're playing collegiate football. It's not like the NCAA tournament. Now the NCAA tournament, you play one game, winner take all, and it's really exciting. But if you're not in the tournament, so like a Ben Simmons, for example, he didn't play in the in the subpar tournament that LSU had to go into when he was there at LSU. He decided that he was going to focus on the draft and not play. And a lot of people kind of crashed down on him for that. But it's just not the same. You don't feel like getting up for the game. Some people really need competition in order to get up, especially in basketball, but for football... It's still there. If you're not in the high stakes, high reward competition and you don't feel like you're going to benefit anything from playing there, you're not going to do it. So when somebody declares for the draft because they're in some bowl that barely anybody ever watches or anybody's ever heard of, it's just not it. It's not it for them. They realize that I should probably be focusing on going to the league and trying my best to make that work. And that's really for the the first rounders, the second round, the third rounders. For the sub third round, maybe the fourth round, uh, those fifth round and sixth round guys, these and the undrafted, supposedly they are going to be undrafted, but they uh, want to try and make a splash and be able to get into the sixth round and make a draft, get a draft pick. It is kind of a situation of know know who you are. I don't think some people have uh, self-awareness when they do this sort of leaving the last game, going out, and preparing for the draft. Because people say they're preparing for the draft all the time. 
But what does that really entail? Are you preparing for the combine? Because there's so many stories of people having a really good combine, a really good pro day, and their stocks rise, right? People like da- like uh, Davenport for the Saints, the DN, who had an excellent uh he had an excellent senior game, and then when he came into the combine, he had some really staggering numbers as well. Moved up his draft stock, and he became a first-round pick from that all in a few months. But that doesn't happen for everybody. Everybody who goes to a small school wants to make a name for themselves in some way, in some some sort of fashion. And it's really difficult because all these Power 5 schools are so televised, so everybody's scouting them. And as much as scouting has improved to find these players in smaller schools and diamonds in the rough, so to speak, it's still not to an uh, it's still not there to get everybody and everybody a look. You're gonna get miss. You're gonna not be seen as much. You're gonna be misevaluated. People are gonna have a certain idea of you just because of the school you went to, and a lot of people want to change that mindset and. More power to them. I just wish that they would go out and play bowl games sometimes because it could be televised. You don't know who's watching that game. And you could have a really, really breakout game if you're that talented as you think you are. And you can show people that, hey, look out for me during the combine. Hey, look out for me during my pro day. And I think that some people are so good at a certain level that they forget where they are now. It's the whole idea of athlete. Like, you know how people say, oh, he's playing at a different level. I think that's a, it's a really big cliche in sports, but it matters because when you leave high school, generally as a college football player recruit, you're probably the best player, one of the best players in your county, in your state, especially if you go in like division one, division two. You're, you're the best player. You have this bravado to you. You feel good, confident, and you need that. You need that edge to make you play even harder at the next level. But sometimes you realize you're not that good, right? Once you get to college and you, there's a different level to the game. And it's like that in every sport, especially in basketball. But in football, it's very drastic. You can see who are literally the best players. Someone from division one, would tear a new one into somebody in Division Two or Three because of the talent. It's just a different level of the sport. So when players at smaller Division One schools don't feel like they're getting the shine because they were either not looked at or they feel like their talent is supremely up there with the rest of them, but in reality, it's just a different speed, a different beast. It's hard for people to accept that. So instead of playing in that bowl game, they're like, they go in and try to prepare for the draft to prove their physical abilities, what they can give to the table. But if it, if that doesn't work out, then it was all for not. I'd much rather have played in the bowl game, give it my last hoorah, give it my all, then declare. Because at the end of the day, it's your last season, probably your last time. At that school, for most players, you never know what you can do. So let's take a let's take a second look at some of these people committing to leave and go start their NFL career. Because sometimes maybe you're just not that good yet, and you need that extra oomph to really push your name into the conversation. Because you can always improve. You can try and build yourself up to that level. By working hard, there's plenty of people who got to the league and worked hard to get there. But working hard also means being committed. All right, so we're going to take another break. And then coming up after that, we're going to look at, is Tua a top 10 prospect after the hip injury? Coming up next. 
Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G- smcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC College Football podcast and last time we were talking about people sitting out bowl games preparing for the NFL draft and just how I feel about that scenario and situation going on in college football and now we're going to talk about one player that was once highly projected to be maybe even the number one overall pick of the NFL draft this coming up 2020 and now he has fallen a bit due to injury and maybe a bit due to Second thoughts on his play before the injury, and that was Tua for Alabama. The quarterback recently had a hip injury right after the LSU game. The next game, the next week after that, he had the hip injury, and it was really gruesome. It was a tough sight to see, and honestly, you never want to see that happen to a player of his caliber and of his stature preparing for the NFL draft, waiting to see what he would be able to do at the next level because. He's going to be going to the next level no matter what happens. It's just where he will be placed in the draft and picked. And what teams really need to look at picking him up. So, let's start here. Before the injury and preseason rankings, power rankings, coaches, AP polls, Alabama was, of course, a, one of the top seeds and uh, top ranked teams in the nation because of him at quarterback. And, of course, Nick Saban. But more like quarterback. He's really good. Really talented. People thought he would go first overall in the top three at the very least. And I still tend to agree with that notion from back then at that time. And, of course, the injury has happened. And we've seen where teams have fallen in the draft order, so to speak, in the NFL. And now there's a lot of teams having second thoughts and looking at different players. And, of course, the the emergence of superstar Joe Burrow has placed a, placed a weird mark for Tua in this draft, according to mock drafts and uh, big boards and all that good stuff. So Tua is still probably going to go in the top 10. It's just a matter of which team is going to take their shot at them. But I don't really think he is going to get drafted in the top five just because there's a lot of teams that are not good this season, but not because they feel like they need to go out and get a franchise changing quarterback. And that is something that I would look into heavily. I'll watch that heavily as the draft gets closer. Closer When it gets closer to the draft time, I really look at that. Now, Of course, the Bengals are probably going to walk away with the first overall pick, and many people believe that's going to be Joe Burrow. It's hard to see the Bengals walk away from letting somebody, Ohio born and raised, an Ohio kid, walk away from going to Cincinnati and being their franchise quarterback. It's a good story. It's a good image. It's a good fit. It'd be nice to see. So... I would, it's almost like a 95% lock at this point that they're going to go and get Joe Burrow. And then after that, probably Chase Young, who is most likely the best player in college football across the board. He's probably number one on many people's big boards as far as talent, but he's probably going to go second overall. And from then on, you just really don't know what you're going to see and what you're going to get. Because at the end of the day, it's about what you are trying to build a team around and who do you think has the best chances of having an impact for you right now at a low contract 
because the way NFL teams are structured these days, especially at the quarterback position, is if they can hit on a quarterback when they're young, a youth youth quarterback, someone like Lamar Jackson, someone like when Jared Goff was cheap or anything like that, you hit the lottery in a sense. Not because they're just good, but because they're good and cheap. So you can build around, you can make trades, you can sign good free agents to big money contracts and put those pieces around that young quarterback in order to maximize Super Bowl window potential. Because as soon as that quarterback gets paid, it gets harder to win because it's harder to find pieces. So then you have to go back to the draft. But let's say the Rams from last year, right? They went and figured, okay, Jared Goff was pretty good under Tom under Sean McVay. We're going to maximize our Super Bowl window, which was basically these last two years, and sign all these people to big contracts. They are trading their first round picks. They're making all different types of trades and signings to maximize their window to make it all the way to win the Super Bowl. Because that's the goal. If they don't win the Super Bowl, it's a big risk, but that is it. Then they have to basically tear it down, try to get better in the draft, and make it do start over, essentially. Same thing happened in Seattle. Seattle has had a bit of an interesting situation because when they got Russell Wilson in the third round, of course, he was playing with house money when they found out that uh, he was good and he was good and cheap before they paid him. So they maximized their window. They focused solely on that defense. That defense went and got paid. And they were dominant, and they got a Super Bowl out of it. They don't regret any choice they made. Then they pay Russell Wilson, and then they the defense kind of teetered off a bit. People have gone to different teams, separate ways, made trades and such. But now it's the Russell Wilson show, and it's still a good team. They're still a good team because they have... They know how to draft well. They have a good coach. But not everybody has good draft knowledge and have a good coach. So striking while the iron is hot is a very popular way of building your NFL team to maximize Super Bowl winning capabilities. So that's to say, where will Tua really fall? And I've been looking at some some mock drafts, and a lot of people have them going between the, the nine... From like four to nine seems to be where he might fall. And it really just depends on what the team needs. So, for example, uh, Jeffrey Akuda coming out of Ohio State is looking to be the fourth overall pick in some mock drafts to the Washington Redskins. And the Redskins really don't know what they need. They need a lot of pieces. They don't know if Haskins is their guy. But it doesn't mean they're going to give up on Haskins one one day and one year, essentially, one year is a lot for a quarterback, especially since he didn't start. He wasn't the starter in general. And then they fired their head coach midseason. They don't really know what they have in Haskins. So who's to say that they need to cut bait this early? They're probably going to be bad again next year. So they're just trying to weigh their options to see what they can get and just build talent and get good players that can play now in the NFL. Same thing with the Lions, because they already have a quarterback, so that's not really a big thing. And you never really know what you have, and you can't trust a rookie quarterback as far as what they're offering you right now. You don't know what they'll be three, four years down the line, and not every quarterback is a finished product. Same thing with Cleveland. You don't know if Baker Mayfield is your guy yet, because The rookie season, he ended off well, but right now he's not been playing very well. You don't know what he is, but you can't give up on him. You should never give up on a player that's 25 and under because they're not what they are. They're not developed yet. So that's why a lot of teams are going with players that they know can have an impact. So a lot of these offensive tackles, a lot of defensive ends. So you got to know what the right situation is. There's no way... The Jets are giving up on Sam Darnold after they put this much time and effort in it. I'd say it takes three or four years before somebody gets canned out the league or out their starting position, and they look to build a new. 
it's usually about four years, sometimes three, if things really do teeter down the rabbit hole. And of course, there's still more quarterbacks in every draft. The Clemson draft, I like to call it, is coming up next year when their quarterback is ready to go. And he's going to be a highly looked at prospect coming in in a first round pick, probably a number one pick candidate as well. So you never really know where the, place, where the pieces may be. Some people are saying the Chargers might be a good fit because Phil Rivers' decline has been really, really shocking and coming really, really quick. And maybe it'd be a good thing for the Chargers to rebrand themselves, look a little bit more youthful. And essentially the old guard is coming out of the NFL. So that's just something to think about for the future. Tua is still probably going to be a top 10 pick. It just depends on what the teams really want to do. So coming after this next break, we're going to get into our last segment, which is name your top three people, or I'm going to name my top three people, to build your program around in college football. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC College Football Podcast, where last time we talked about Tua and his draft projections, and now we're going to end the podcast on a little bit of a of a who would you pick note, and that is what person, player, system would you take to start a program of your choosing if everybody reset today? So this is obviously a little bit speculative. This would never happen. But if there is three people or some sort of situation where you would choose to start your collegiate program for football to be, what would it be? So I'm going to say I'm going to start from the, the bottom up because that's typically how these things go. I would probably pick Nick Saban as number three. Because he would get the job done. Nick Saban is a winner. He is all business all the time. And he's just a gigantic figure in college football history. College football in general. So the thing about Nick Saban is he doesn't get enough credit for how much people generally play for him. I don't know if he is well-liked by players. A lot of players who come from Alabama have love Alabama. They say Nick Saban gets their players right and they get them ready to play. I don't know if he is a a player's coach per se. And to be honest, I don't know if he actually likes when his players go in the draft. I'm sure he does. I'm sure that, but you know, he never seemed 100% happy that he's losing such a good player every year and a lot of players do leave to go to the draft from his program so I'm sure he's used to it but it never seems like he's really really excited to have players leave his system and if that's the case they go to NFL you can keep forever but (laughs) uh he is an excellent head coach he is a leader of men I would love to start Nick Saban As my head coach in that sort of situation, just because I know with Nick Saban comes the recruitment, comes the the defensive coordinators, offensive coordinators, just the whole program. Nick knows what to do to build a program around. He did at LSU. He's done at Alabama. His NFL stint wasn't the best, but what can you say? Number two, I think I'm going to go with Justin Fields quarterback out of Ohio State. I think Justin Fields, if you build around a player of his caliber, of his skill level in the college football era, where it's high scoring, high offense, high octane people, athletes all across the field, the college quarterback in 20, 
2019, 2020, 2021 in the foreseeable future has to be an athlete. There is now just because the word athlete is used doesn't mean they have to run like a a four or five at the quarterback position and be able to shake somebody out their shoes like Lamar like Lamar Jackson per se. Lamar Jackson is a super freak when it comes to athleticism. He is a unicorn, and that's why he's so dominant in the NFL right now because there's been plenty of players who were athletic with their legs to go to the league, but it doesn't always work out. Primarily because people don't scheme, do not set their offense around that player. Sometimes they, they bring them in and they think that they are above the idea of having to build for a player. They think that that player should be able to be good enough to conform to the system they want to run. And that's why I give a lot of credit to the Ravens and building a system for Lamar in the off season to make this whole run that they're on look as good as it is. With that being said, Justin Fields might be in the same situation. He's not as athletically gifted as Lamar Jackson, but he's still athletically gifted, and he's really good, and he makes a lot of people miss, and he can do so much with the football. And something like a weapon like that on your team is just, you can't value it enough. It's paramount to have people across the board, and it starts with the quarterback position. If you have a good quarterback, you can make good decisions, can make the right read, and if the read isn't there, can still do something with their feet and make somebody miss and pick up some yardage for you. That's a powerful weapon to have. Now, you don't have to have the most athletic player like him. Like There's other players who are athletic in their own right who can move around the pocket. You want pocket mobility. And I think Justin Fields has a really good pocket presence and is able to get outside the pocket, make some throws, can do some some play action, bootleg stuff. He can uh, pick up some yardage. He can get in the run game with his own legs, a la Lamar Jackson, and do some really big things. So that's why I would pick him second, only to another head coach to be the, the first. And I think if I could start my program from scratch, from the very beginning, dirt paved over, I'm going to pick Lincoln Riley. Not only as a head coach, but just his situation in general. He's just a brilliant offensive-minded coach. He's an um, amazing offensive mind in the state of football in general. People have been trying to take him away from his situation in Oklahoma for the better half of a year as far as rumors go. People have been trying to send offers for him to come to the NFL and head coach somebody's team. And there's no way he'd leave for offensive coordinator position. Because the situation is so good. He has the opportunity to become the next Dabble Sweeney, the next Urban Meyer in college football, the next um, the next Nick Saban. He is a superstar coach. And he's proven it by making all these quarterbacks who he's essentially gotten transfers into superstars. Amazing players. Highly talented. You want to know who came into the NFL because Lincoln Riley? Baker Mayfield. You know who else is going to go to the NFL probably? Jalen Hurts. And their offenses are dynamic. Dynamic. So his system for what he runs for offense and making quarterbacks better than maybe what they end up being. They're just amazing all the time. He's a superstar studded coach. And I would kill to have a coach where he knows that he is here to stay. He's not always worried about his job. And he gets the job done on the field, off the field. Seems like an amazing guy to have in a system. So let's go over the the three that I've chosen. Maybe uh, I'll give you a fourth just, uh, just as a bonus. So let's give you a fourth just as a bonus. Just to, to make the crowd a little bit happier. If there was a fourth person I would choose on the fly, it would probably be the situation that maybe I would just want Notre Dame just because of the the history and the success that you could have in a Notre Dame situation. And this is not to say I want the head coach or a player from Notre Dame. I just mean the 
just me in the college atmosphere. Notre Dame is like a, it's kind of cultish <laughs> to say as far as how their fans and the following and how people follow that football team. They're so much into that, so, so much into that program that people love. People love Notre Dame. And it would be interesting to see if you can build a championship contender in Notre Dame because every time they are in the running for the BCS or the national title game or anything like that, they are always on 10 out of 10, maybe 11 out of 10 as far as excitement. It would just be an amazing atmosphere to be a part of. So Notre Dame would be somebody that I would 100% take a job offer for if I was a head coach or a player, just because you never know. If you can make something happen at Notre Dame, you're a legend forever. It doesn't matter what you do. You could be, you can do so many great things at LSU, Alabama. Eventually you will not be remembered as super fondly in national media. But if you do something at Notre Dame, you're in doctrine forever. And that's just a fact. People love Notre Dame. (laughs) So with that said, that's going to be the end of the podcast. Thank you for listening to the GSMC football podcast, the collegiate football podcast hosted by the GSMC podcast network. I'm your host, Ethan Orfe. Thank you for listening. Uh, Please don't forget to rate and respond. Leave a comment. Give us five stars on a review on any of the platforms. And don't forget to follow us on social media. And that is our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network, from football to basketball, baseball to MMA. And even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.